Well, good morning. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, and thank you for joining us for the State Water Resources Control Board's Drinking Water Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Program fee stakeholder meetings. This meeting is being held virtually through the Zoom and webcast platforms, and it also is being recorded. My name is David Ciaccarelli, and I'm, I am the Fee and Revenue Branch Manager within the Division of Administrative Services. Um, for those that um, are um, broadcast, uh, can I, um, I, I apologize, Stephanie, can you go back to the first screen there? Let me just go through here. Um, as I mentioned, my name is David Ciaccarelli. I am the Fee and Revenue Branch Manager within the Division of Administrative Services. Um, thank you, Stephanie. Um, the screen that's up right now on the um, on the uh, web feed, um, for those that are um, watching only or want to watch only, that you're joining us for the first time here, um, the video.calepa.ca.gov gives you access to the webcast. And those that uh, are requesting to um, join through Zoom, um, there is the link there, the email, which is das-drinkingwaterfees at waterboards.ca.gov. Um, please send an email uh, to, with your name, your who you represent, um, and um, a uh, participate, you know, video conference if you want through, through the phone. Please provide your last three digits or your phone number. So we appreciate that. Um, also, um, with us today is John Russell, the Deputy Director at Division Administrative Services. And I also want to um, introduce um, Cassandra White, who is also the Staff Service Manager 2 in the Fee and Revenue Branch, and she will, she will be assisting with the presentation today. Um, today, we have many of the Fee and Revenue Branch staff working behind the scenes to ensure that the meeting runs as smoothly as possible. If at any time throughout this event, you find that you are having technical difficulties, Please email um, again the email on the screen there, which is das-drinkingwaterfees at waterboards.ca.gov. Individuals, atten individuals attending through or via the Zoom, please use the raise the hand function if you want to ask a question or provide a comment. If you're joining us through the webcast, you can also submit a comment or ask a question by emailing the email on the screen. In the past, there has been um, some delays in the broadcast through the webcast. Therefore, through the meeting, staff may pause so the broadcast can catch up to the listeners. Again, we thank you for joining us virtually today. We thank you for your patience as we move to this 100% virtual meeting space. Uh, we're doing our best to ensure everyone can participate in an effective manner. I do want to mention that um, in our upcoming stakeholder meetings in June and August, we are we are in the process of uh, going to try to find uh, meeting rooms at the Cal EPA building in Sacramento. Um, and our meeting, we're going to try to have our meetings uh, in house, but at the same time, um, we're, we'll give the option also the, of providing uh, the Zoom platform. So we'll be um, having the meetings in house, but at the same time having the Zoom platform. So today, I just want to go over some uh, of the meeting guidelines. Um, one, remember to use the handouts that were sent to you via email. If you do not have the handouts, that's okay. Um, we'll be sharing the documents on the screen. You can request a copy of the documents after the meeting, uh, or the handouts are posted on the fee website. Remember, any technical difficulties um, that you may be having, please um, um, email us. Please remember to mute yourself when you're not speaking. And again, uh, remember you can submit comments and questions throughout the event by sending them to the email that's uh, posted uh, currently on the on the web page. For the meetings to run efficiently and stay on track, we're requesting each participant who wants to ask a question, please ask one question at a time. I understand you may have clarifying questions to your original questions, and that's acceptable. Once your question is fully answered, we are going to move on to the next participant's question, and you'll be put back into the order of participants who are requesting to ask a question. In addition, if the discussion starts to move away from the tent of the meeting, 
which is to discuss drinking water and ELAP fees. Then I'm going to ask the participant and I to meet offline and coordinate these discussions further and involve the appropriate staff as needed. So at this time, let me um, review the agenda. So first on the agenda, we're going to uh, go over attachment one, which is the safe drinking water account budget cost drivers. Attachment two is the safe drinking water account fund condition. Then we'll move into um, the ELAP program and discuss the ELAP budget cost drivers. And then we'll have an open discussion, um, next steps um, after that. And so at this point, let me uh, introduce John Russell, uh, the Deputy Director of Division Administrative Services for um, any opening words. Good morning, everybody. Um, I just wanted to uh, echo what David said and thank you for taking a few minutes out of your day to, to be with us here today. And then I, before I forget, I want to say, and as I do at all of these meetings, that if you have any questions during this meeting or am, after this meeting, um, any clarification that you need or any additional information or anything, don't hesitate to contact uh, David or myself or Cassandra. Um, some of the information you're going to be seeing today, we haven't been able to show for a couple of years, but our accounting processes have, have caught up. And uh, the, the fund condition statement that you'll see is, is just pretty complicated. So as you go over that in the next few days or weeks, if you have questions, like I said, don't hesitate to reach out and, and talk to us. Other than that, I'll, I'll hand it back to David. Thank you. Um, so let's move to attachment one. Um, Cassandra White is going to um, walk us through both of these charts here. Um, before she does, I do want to mention that um, the information that's being shown here is based off of the governor's January proposed budget, um, which was released um, second week of uh, January. Um, and so um, it's still early in, in the budget process. Um, we, we hold these meetings just to give an update of, of where the numbers and the budgetary expenditures are landing, plus looking at our um, revenue stream and how those two compare. Um, so let me uh, pass this on to Cassandra and she'll walk you through the uh, budgetary cost drivers for the safe drink of water account. Thank you, David. Good morning, everyone. So as we look here at the first table, the first number is the fee setting budget used to set fees last September. And that amount was $39.6 million, followed by the governor's January proposed fee setting budget for fiscal year 23-24 is 43.2 million, a net difference of about 3.6 million or 9.1%. And the second table shows us what's, called, what's driving the program costs. And the first cost driver is state operations, which is made up of salaries, healthcare, and retirement. And that cost increased just over $3 million at 7.7% increase. The next cost driver is a spending authority termination due to the expiration of the fiscal year 1920 microplastic BCP. Um, it was a BCP testing the microplastics in drinking water and it expired June 30, 2022. And that authority that has been um, released or returned back to the fund is $175,000. Um, just under one half percent has been returned to the safe drinking water account. And the final cost driver is pro rata, which shows an increase of about $730,000, 1.8%. And you may recall pro rata is indirect costs incurred for services performed by the state's central service agencies. And a few examples of those agencies are the Department of Finance, State Controller's Office, and Department of Human Resources. The cost is applied to all state agencies, including the water boards and each of its programs. 
And so that kind of wraps up the cost driver details supporting the overall safe drinking water account increase of about $3.6 million, and again, and 9.1%. This concludes our look at the 23-24 cost drivers for safe drinking water account. Do you have any questions at this time? Or any email questions? If not, I'll move back, hand it back to David. Thank you, Cassandra. Yeah, one thing I just wanted to highlight uh, with the safe drinking water account, um, uh, based on, of course, the January's budget, there are no um, current BCPs that are that are uh, augmenting the program, meaning increasing the program at this time, increasing the fund. Um, there, there was a, a BCP a couple of years ago, which which augmented the program um, for you know over kind of a two year span, basically. But um, nothing in the budget this year. Um, basically, what's driving costs are. Um, our, uh, you know, our standard um, employee compensation, retirement, health care, and prorata costs, which um, is somewhat out of our hands because that's directed by the Department of Finance. Um, so um, the the program, it's kind of important to note here that the the, the budget that we're looking at is 43.1, which is a net difference of about 9.1% um, uh, compared to our fee setting budget um, last September when we went to the board. So as I see no questions, um, let's let's move to the fund condition statement. Thank you. So the fund condition statement attachment to, um, as those that have been with us for, for multiple years, uh, this is the first time that we've shown this since I believe 1819. Um, and the, the main result of not being able to show it was not, our, our, we did not have the capability of reporting uh, documents as we we're implementing the new accounting system fiscal. Um, and we, we have now, um, our accounting office has now closed the books up until fiscal year 21-22, which also um, reports have been developed and created and uh, fee and accounting staff are able to utilize those to identify our expenditures and revenues in the program. Uh, so, I'm gonna kind of walk through this. I'm gonna try to be as clear and concise. I know there's a lot of information and this may be the first time that some of you have seen this document uh, in, you know, for the first time or, or, or it's been uh, in several years. Um, and a couple of things to point out is that um, as you look at top where we see the fiscal years, fiscal year 22, 23 um, and 23, 24, um, a lot of that's just based on projections. Um, the fee revenue is based on projections of what we what we invoice. Um, and when you get down to the expenditure categories, those are our budgetary expenditures. So um, we what I will say is that earlier this week, we did get um, uh, our first expenditure report for fiscal year 22-23, which is basically um, the first month of the fiscal year, July. Um, and we anticipate that that um, those months, our accounting office is going to be able to close those months um, more efficiently, a little more quicker um, as the fiscal fiscal year goes on. So I do anticipate when we come into the June stakeholder meeting that my expenditure number on this report for fiscal year 22, 23, we'll be able to update with a more accurate projection. So we'll get off of, of the budgeted number and then have more of a what our projected expenditures are gonna look like. So let me start with 21-22 um, fiscal year because this is the last year um, where we've closed the books. And these are the numbers that the Water Board reports on our official fund condition statement that goes over to controllers and finance and, and, and goods booked in the, the governor's budget. Um, so let me start with what the beginning balance of is of 2.6 million that we see up top there. Um, and keep in mind, these all these numbers are are uh, as as the fund condition states in millions. Although, of course, you know not everything is is a million dollars there. Um, so our beginning balance is two point six million. That's a carryover from the prior year of twenty twenty one. 
And then we have what's known as prior year adjustments. And I just want to just briefly talk about what that is. Um, there, there are three factors that come into prior year adjustments. One, if there's contracts in the fund that the fund supports, and when a contract is executed, it's executed for a certain dollar amount. So I'm going to use an example of a contract of a million dollars. And there's a, a term life of the contract, right? Let's say it's a three-year term. Um, and at the end of the three years, if it's not fully spent, meaning that the contract didn't fully spend that $1 million, and, and as this example, let's say it's $500,000, um, the remaining $500,000 that didn't get spent, it reverts back into the fund. So um, there are times when a contracts don't fully get expended, and then that our accounting office needs to make adjustments, and that money becomes a prior adjustment. Second thing is... Um, uh, Although, you know, our accounting office and our staff would do our, our best to ensure that staff are charging to the appropriate charge codes and, and, and tr uh, funds. However, if it's if it's noticed through timesheets that an employee has charged to the wrong fund, um, then we take steps to ensure that amended timesheets are done. And then those charges are charged to the appropriate fund. So if we do notice that whether there's um, uh, uh, an employee charge to this fund or a different fund, and it's it's determined that that the charges are associated with the safe drinker water account. That amended timesheets are done internally, and then those charges are reflected, which could also result on a prior adjustment. The third thing, um, when it comes to prior adjustments, is that in the California state accounting practices, that everything that we invoice, so with the water board invoices that all becomes what booked revenue for the first year. So what I mean by that is, is when we invoice $35 million of, of drinking water invoices, our accounting office will book all that in the first year as revenue. Now we recognize that we don't have a hundred percent collection rate. Um, let's say of the 35 million, we collect 34 million in the first year. That means accounting goes through and makes a, you know, adjustment of the of the non collectible revenue in you know after that first year. Now, with that said, you know we continue to collect on it um, if needed. The, you know, we have we have collection agencies that work on our bad debt after one year, um, and if revenue is coming in, then accounting posts that because it may come in, in in a future year. But that also becomes a prior year adjustment. So those are basically kind of the three factors that go into a prior year adjustment. And as you can see for 2122, um, there was um, a negative amount of $88,000. Now, as you kind of look in some of the prior years, there were some positive um, adjustments that took place. So you take the uh, back to 2122. So you take the negative prior adjustment uh, away from the beginning balance, which basically means that we had an adjusted beginning balance of 2.5 million. Um, in the year, um, we collected about 34.4 million in, in all of our regulatory fees. Um, we had other re revenue, which basically means um, uh, that's broken down by um, our, our, our investments in our surplus money investments, which of course, you know, uh, Department of Finance tracks. Um, so there's 62,000 there. Um, we also identify any delinquent fees. So um, we break that out. So there's 102,000 there. And then uh, we also assess penalty assessments or citations. And so there's 42,000 there. Um, what also happened though in this year, and this was a one time thing, um, which I discussed at, at yesterday's water quality and water rights meetings, is that um, uh, AB 84 basically. Um, had to do with the pension buy down and that um, Department of Finance gave direction to all agencies, all the state departments, and that um, our, our, our department um, had to pay back um, our, our portion of the pension buy down. And then Department of Finance basically directed us to spread those costs to each of the funds. And so um, the safe drinking water fund portion was $877,000. Uh, so this is a one-time thing. We don't expect this to, you know, happen at least in the next few years. 
Um, and it, you know, it didn't happen in the prior year. So when you take that along with um, all of the revenue that was collected through regulatory fees and, and um, delinquencies and penalty assessments and citations, our total revenue was 33.8 million for the year. And then we come down to what our um, expenditures were in a year, our state operation expenditures. So our internal state operations, meaning our water board staff that are working on you know, the drink of water program was 32.3 million. And then we had other state operations, which includes um, Cal EPA, um, pro rata, healthcare costs. Um, so those expenditures um, are other state operations. So there's a, a total expenditure of 35.2 million, um, which basically there was a, a negative deficit. There was a deficit in that year of 1.4 million. So um, our expenditures exceeded our revenues about 1.4 million. Now, we did have a beginning balance of two and a half million, which helped subsidize that. But as you can see, our, our reserve um, and our ending balance drew down to about a million dollars, which is basically about a 3% um, reserve in this fund. And as you can see that um, in, the, in the prior years, it was more around nine, getting close to 10%. Uh, so looking at the current year, um, you know, the, the beginning ba ending balance becomes the beginning balance at this time. Of course, I, you know, we don't have any reports here. We don't have a prior adjustment. Um, we're anticipating collecting um, total fees of about 40.8 million. Um, and we anticipate our, our total expenditures to be 39.5 million, um, which as you can see, um, keeps us in the positive. So we are, our expenditures and our revenue are, you know, in line a, a little high, but in line, and then basically gives us an ending balance of 2.3 million, which is about a 5.9% reserve. So what we're illustrating here on this is if we say, well, um, if we don't do any fee increases um, in this upcoming year, um, this kind of reckon, uh, this basically paints the picture of what um, the fund condition would look like. Um, we know, as we showed on the cost drivers, that our, our expenditures are going up by about 9.1% over $3 million. And so um, the ending balance, um, and as you can see, the deficit compared to our expenditures with our, our total expenditures with our revenues would be about $2.3 million. Um, and basically balancing, ending the balance about $31,000. So we really wouldn't have any reserve. Um, and, but what I'm be really concerned with is that, um, our revenues on, are not covering our actual expenditures in that year. So, um, what we're highlighting here and is what it would look like again to, um, balance our, our revenues expenditures in the year, um, and, you know, where the reserve would fall out. and so. Um, basically, what we've done here, and we just showed this one example, um, because this example is just, again, balancing our total revenues and our total expenditures in fiscal year 23-24. So at about a 6.5% increase on the uh, safe drinking water, our, on our drinking water program, um, our total revenues would, would line up about $43.5 million, and then our expenditures would be $43.187 that we're anticipating, which again, then leaves our, our balance about $335,000 in that year. Um, so that's balancing the fund. And then that does lead us to about a 6.2% reserve. Um, in a fund this size, it's, it's, it's a little low. Um, I will say that we do try to, um, like, the, like the water rights fund, which is about the same size, um, that we try to shoot for about 10% reserve. Uh, but I'm, you know, at this point, I'm just highlighting what it would look like just to kind of balance our expenditures and revenues, which is about a six and a half percent reserve, a six and a half percent increase. Um, so that's where we um, land with the fund condition. Again, it's first time we've been able to show this in, in um, several years. Um, I'm anticipating as we move into our June meeting that I'll have better, da better data and more accurate data. Um, for our expenditures. 
Um, so we'll be able to shore that up. Um, and if, if our expenditures do come in lower than our budgetary expenditures um, and our revenues coming in kind of where we project it in 22, 23, then we may see, you know, a higher ending balance uh, for 22, 23, which of course, you know, leads us into where, where we're going to land for uh, 23, 24. So I know it's a lot of information. Um, I will open it up to questions. If anyone has any questions, I will say that um, if, as John mentioned, if, you know, after this meeting, you start to take a look at this and you have um, questions or you want to know what some of the numbers mean, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or Cassandra. I'll be more than happy to meet with you. Um, so any questions at this time? So no, no uh, questions um, uh, from the emails and I don't hear any from uh, uh, those that are participating through Zoom. So again, uh, we'll continue to monitor the drinking water program um, as we get into the next budget process. And we'll be updating, of course, the cost drivers and the fund condition uh, for our June meeting. So let's move to um, ELAP. And um, before I move this off to Cassandra, Cassandra is gonna talk about our cost drivers. Um, again, these are cost drivers that are based on, um, that we're in the you know fee setting budget um, compared to what's in the governor's budget. Um, and um, I will say at this point, we, we do not have a fund condition. We're still um, working through those numbers and we expect to be able to have a fund condition for our um, uh, June meeting. Um, I'll get into a little more details of why um, after we talk about the fund condition. Uh, but Cassandra, go ahead and you know, we'll walk through the Environmental Laboratory Improvement Fund budget cost drivers. Okay, thank you. Okay, as we look at table number one for last year's fee setting budget was 4.7 million, followed by the governor's January proposed fee setting budget for fiscal year 23-24 is about 4.65 million, a net difference of um, minus $85,000 or uh, minus 1.8%. And the second table kind of gives us a little better picture of what's driving those costs. The first is state ops, and you see there was a minimal increase of $11,000 at um, a 0.2% increase. And again, state ops covers salaries, healthcare, and retirement. And then the next one was, and the last cost driver is pro rata. And there was a decrease in pro rata this year of $96,000, 2%. And so that the, the two cost drivers overall, you see that there's been a decrease to the program of, like I said, $85,000 and the 1.8%. So that's our look at the cost drivers for the ELAP program. Are there any questions at this time? So let me let me add something also, Cassandra. Um, when it comes to the pro rata, um, pro rata has gone down. Of course, this is the second year that pro rata cost has gone down. I, I mentioned this last year. Um, that I believe it was in 21, 22, um, that pro rata was, was a little on the high side for, for this fund of uh, department of finance recognized it. But they also mentioned that they would take steps to, um, uh, to fix the pro rata cost, make those adjustments. So last year 
it went down and then um, it's also been drawn down this year also. So it, it does look like it's, it's balancing itself out um, for the size of the fund. So um, that's really uh, that big, that portion there, um, along with, of course, um, you know, the share of state operations in this fund, um, not increasing too much. So, um, yes, the, the budget authority um, in the program has been slightly lower um, uh, from uh, fiscal year 22-23. So um, I, I, first of all, I just want to kind of start the conversation with we we reckon we recognize that, but we also recognize that you know we we're not kind of working under the operations of of, of our budgetary cost drivers. Um, what I mean by that is that um, you know staff has recognized that our, our revenue streams of fees are not meeting our budgetary expenditures, and as a result, um, last year you know we we took measures of minimizing our, our ELIF uh, expenditures. Um, and we also recognize that, you know, ELIF expenditures are nowhere near our budgetary expenditures because of the fact that, that we've been taking measures behind the scenes. Um, first of all, just kind of, again, um, the history as, as, as staff of the water boards, you know, we recognize, you know, in years past that we had multiple digit fee increases um, there are many reasons why, you know, mainly because the program came to the water boards and was underfunded. You know, we needed to get revenues up to levels to program expenditures. And, you know, this took several years. Um, also, we recognize that, you know, new regulations were implemented, which required new fee schedules. Um, you know, we, we also listened to stakeholders concerns over fee increases and internally, you know, fee and ELAP staff got together and evaluated what can be done to lessen the burden of fee increases to this program and looked at ways of minimizing fee increases. Um, last year, water board staff identified an alternative funding source in which three ELAP staff um, were able to charge to, and as a result, were able to minimize um, expenditures in ELIF, which, which met, you know, no fee increases for last year, fiscal year 22, 23. So we were able to hold fees. Um, so no, you know, we did not raise fees last year. Um, I did mention this, you know, last year during our stakeholder process that moving forward, you know, I couldn't commit to saying that this funding source is going to be available each year for ELAP. Um, but you know, we would be evaluating it. And that's what I wanted to just state right now that we are in the process of evaluating if we can ensure that the, you know, at, at a minimum that those three staff are gonna be able to charge to an alternative funding source here at the water boards. Um, and by doing that, of course, we're able to minimize expenditures. So we are, again, taking steps behind the scenes of looking at how, you know, we can you know, help minimize um, expenditures in a program, but also operate a full program. Um, and I will, I, I do realize, uh, that what program did was, um, there were three staff that charged to, you know, a different funding source. And we're evaluating that to, um, ensure that we can do the same thing this year. Um, last year though, also that there were two staff, when I say last year, of course, the year that we're in currently right now that that there were two staff that were also, I believe the term was kind of put on hold that um, that um, weren't um, charging to ELAP also. And so um, as a result, that of course helped, you know, lowered our expenditures. Um, we are looking at um, our revenue stream um, based on, of course, you know, the number of labs that are um, enrolled and participating in, in the uh, ELAP. Um, and so we recognize that that's what drives our revenue. Um, we do again recognize that that revenue isn't anywhere near our budgetary allotments. And so that's why we're taking kind of the steps behind the scenes. Um, it also means why, you know, we don't have, because we're evaluating all the numbers, a lot of the numbers are moving pieces right now. Um, I don't have all the numbers in place to, to put together a fund condition, but I do anticipate that we'll have something prepared and, and, being able to show uh, for our 
um, June meeting. Um, so before before I kind of open it up, I know I know there's some questions. I there was a couple of questions I think sent to us um, be, uh, um, in advance, and I think Debbie, you had a couple of questions. I did want to just um, move this to Caitlin or Christine, if one of you guys want to just kind of talk about the status of the program and, and, and things that are going on now and then, and then you know, kind of what, what the future looks like. Great, thank you, David, for giving me the opportunity to speak. So I do just want to echo what you were saying earlier um, about we're really looking at the program's um, fund condition and trying to help the laboratories you know, last, just like you said, last year, we had two open positions and we didn't fill it because we knew by filling those positions, there could potentially be an increase um, in the program, which would result in a potential fee increase to the laboratory community. So it's something that we're really paying attention to because we value the laboratories in California. Um, I just want to straight out say that, you know, we, we recognize that the fee population makes a difference in the fees to the lab community. Um, and at this point in time, we don't see an impact in the program because of the alternative funding sources that you were describing earlier. Um, and we're doing our best to try and identify those, those things from a state um, agency perspective that, we, that uses the data, there hasn't been any um, complaints about capacity of laboratories. Um, and, and as you mentioned earlier, we are working to explore different funding alternatives for the program. Um, and I think this is a great opportunity for the stakeholders to help us um, figure out potentially a different path forward in funding ELAC because the lab population does have a direct effect in the fees. So, Wanted to say that, um, and can we can open it to any further questions if we like, David? Okay, and and Caitlin, I know you came on. Is uh, anything uh, came on camera? Anything you want to mention before we open it up? No, nope. um, I'm just here if needed. Okay, um, so we do have a couple of email questions. Um, Allison uh, also just popped on camera, and so let's Allison. Um, Let's go with uh, your questions first. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you very much for the opportunity to engage and ask questions. Um, my, my first question was actually for Caitlin and Christine. Uh, am I hearing correctly that there has not been a significant change to the population of laboratories? In other words, to the, the revenue that's coming into the program because, for instance, laboratories um, uh, decided not to continue their existence or to continue having accreditation. That's my first question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I can take that one. So. Um, I think you misheard that. We have been seeing changes in the population of laboratories since we've come to the board really in 2015. There's been a pretty steady decrease. Um, we've seen um, a slight uptick in that decrease since the regulations were adopted from about four or 5% to about 7% um, over the last year. And um, you know, like David said, the number of labs paying into the fee uh, into the fund impacts how much everybody pays, right? It's a zero sum game. And so that's something that program level we have recognized as, um, or, you know, we see as potentially an issue. Um, and we are exp exploring at our level, um, different, different funding options. We have been able to secure some funding, um, which has alleviated some of the increase, like a potential increase. We held positions open last year to alleviate an increase to the lab community. But it's something that at this point we don't have board direction on and we will need that um, before you know anything um, 
different or any potential like different funding options are um, on the table as like a legitimate path forward. So that's where we're at right now. Um, we don't think there's going to be any major impact to the fees at this point because we have that other funding. Um, but it, at this time, we're, we're not, it's a little bit too early to tell in the year, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, Debbie, um, I know Debbie was online, but I, I'm not sure if she's able to participate, but she did have an uh, email question basically stating, you know, can, can you answer during the ELAP explanation how changes in the certified laboratories are going to impact fees? Um, I, I think, Caitlin, you just touched on it, but maybe you just want to maybe just highlight that again. Sure. So, um, all of the labs, it, it's what they call a zero sum game. So, all if our program is fully funded by fees, then those fees have to be spread out upon uh, through the number of labs that exist in our population. Um, and as that number decreases, the fees tend to increase um, because there's a smaller number of people or labs paying into the fund. Um, so that's why we are looking at different options um, because we, um, you know, it, it's just an observation that we've made. And because since we've come to the board and because of how underfunded the program was at CDPH and because of how many laboratories were able to join the population um, at that time because of those artificially low fees and because of very little regulatory oversight, we saw this big ballooning of um, the number of laboratories. So when we came over, it was around 750, between 700 and 750 labs, if I'm remembering correctly. And since that time, we've seen the market normalizing a bit um, and those fee increases were pretty significant in the first few years. So it's definitely an issue that we're really sensitive to and that we um, have been watching since we came over and we're just constantly asking ourselves if there's um, other options rather than just a direct fee increase to labs, but that's where we're at. And, and um... I think it's important to know uh, when we talk about our expenditures uh, we're and, and the program coming over, you know, since the program came over, the, 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 the growth of the program hasn't um, been augmented or, or, you know, increased by staffing levels. What we're talking about, of course, is those existing staffing levels that came over from us from public health. Um, those costs just continue to go up. Um, Although, of course, reflected on the budget cost drivers this year, there's a slight decrease. And of course, we recognize that's from um, the, the pro rata share. Um, and again, what we're seeing the cost drivers is only from the cost drivers that are from the January budget. Um, you know, we'll be updated you know, when we get to the May revise um, budget, and which we'll uh, be able to show come June. Um, another email question, and this is from... Beth Ohasso from the West Coast Advisors. Um, one, do you anticipate fees going back up next year? And then if so, does it make sense just to does it make sense to just keep it the same this year so we don't get whiplash? Um, well, it's um, I'll, I'll I'll let I'll let Caitlin help answer, but just what you know, my take on it is is you know we're we're evaluating it um, uh, and. You know, we'll, we, you know, we, we try not to have large swings in the program. Um, we recognize we, we did, you know, we did our best again to try to, you know, minimize and, and not have fees last year because we took measures to ensure that that didn't happen. Um, and as Caitlin said, and Christine said, we're doing the same thing. We're in the process of doing the same thing right now. Um, and um, uh, I think we'll be in a better position come June to kind of, discuss where we're kind of landing on what steps can be taken to help, of course, minimize the need for fee increases. Um, Caitlin, you have anything to add to that? Um, not, not much. I mean, you're, you're the, the numbers expert, David, but I would, I would just say from a practical perspective that we didn't increase fees at all on labs last year. And so I would worry that if we don't increase fees two years in a row, then two years from now, you may be seeing an even larger increase depending on what happens next year. So that's kind of a thought too. 
um, about, you know, what the, what the best path is forward rather, you know, if it's a small increase this year and a small increase the, the next year or waiting that out and doing a larger increase two years from now. I think we have to see how the revenue numbers shake out um, before we could make a decision like that. And, and that's correct. And the other thing that we look at also is, um, as I mentioned, the fund condition is, as we talked about it in the drinking water program earlier for the safe drinking water account, um, we're, we're needing to ensure that the fund you know, stays in the positive and so the fund doesn't run into the negative. Um, so we do, and that's as a result of, of course, expenditures compared to revenue. So um, we're needing to at a minimum at least ensure that those revenues are covering those costs um, because when the when the funds do go into the negative then the department of finance starts to ask all these difficult questions and then what steps we're taking to um, move us out of the negative and and um what that means is that when you're looking at a fund condition it basically means that one we're driving cost up to get us out of the, the 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 hole and at the same time then the potential of having to raise fees to cover you know increased cost in the program um so but again i'll be in a better shape to kind of have those discussions as we're starting to analyze the numbers internally for our, our june meeting um allison i you had your hands up again thank you yes um not to monopolize the conversation but i guess my the follow-on question to potential fee increases would be how would you anticipate or is it too early to say how those fee increases would be applied um because it, there are um a handful of laboratories that are paying a um, dramatically higher fees, uh, especially in the commercial sector. Um, so I guess my question is, is that really where the cost burden or the cost drivers are? And will you try to look at the cost drivers and make it a little more equitable uh, in how the fee increases would be spread out? Yeah, that's a really good question, Allison. Um, I think you're right. It's too early to know how we would apply those fee increases. I mean, there are options, right? There's like a straight fee increase to all of the categories. You know, one of the benefits to, um, or one of the intentions behind adopting a tiered fee system is that we could play with the percentage increases and make it either more progressive or regressive, um, depending on, you know, what the, what, what we're trying to accomplish. Um, in terms of equity, I mean, that's that's kind of um, that's a difficult question, right? Because depending on how you look at it, it it is uh, it's different. There are different perspectives on what's equitable. Like there are, you know, some of the commercial labs, the big commercial labs. Yes, they bear the larger portion of the fee burden. But, you, you know, those labs are also doing a majority of the business in the state of California, too. So. You know, those are all questions that we we have to answer and look at and and analyze internally um, and work with the stakeholders in these meetings to get everyone's input on uh, before we would make a decision like like that. But at, at this time, it's just too early. But there are options. Yeah, and I, I and I would just say I think that's as part of these stakeholder meetings, Allison, is that um, we do like to kind of lay out the options and get stakeholder feedback um, before we make any decisions. So um, I think we'll have, you know, like I said, um, better information to provide at our next stakeholder meeting. Um, good morning, Jared, you have your hand up. Hi, good morning, uh, Jared Vosco on behalf of CASA. Um, just first, you know, I, I really wanna make sure uh, we convey our appreciation for having no fee increases, what it took for staff to, achieve that. I, I don't know because that's all behind the scenes and accounting. Uh, I'm just a layman here, but I know our community, um, the public labs are appreciative not to see that increase. Uh, yesterday, we were talking about fees um, for WDRs and MPDS, and those have been going up every year to the tune of 10%, and our folks are concerned about that. So on the other side today, this is really nice to see this. Um, that said, you know, before we saw the proposal, I was kind of hearing that same concern 
about um, the, the change in lab population. And, um, you know, it's something that I think, according to the numbers I've seen, when the regs were adopted in May of 2020, we were around 650 labs and we're down to about 475. I don't know if those are accurate numbers, but if those are more or less accurate numbers, that puts us at a 25% decrease. So what we're talking about is how do the other 75% of the labs spread around that 25%. Um, I, I could have the number wrong, so forgive me if, if so, but I, I think the point is, is that burden is having to be shared and it's larger than larger than um, maybe we anticipated. Um, you know, for the annual ELOP update, I think that's coming up relatively soon or should be. Um, I think that's something we really appreciate if there is a, a bandwidth with ELOP staff, uh, if they could maybe look into the trends for these types of labs to analyze, you know, what is this? Is it the small labs? Is it regional? Any kind of insight would be good. Um, you know, when I speak to my folks, they're trying to comply with this. They're trying to get on board with TNI. They're encountering, you know, struggles with staffing and, and just the workload it entails, but they're they're doing what they have to do. Um, and they're trying, but I am hearing from a lot of them. This is this is not going easy, and this is not easy. Um, and then just backing up and returning to the fees and, and off the the ELAP, you know, um, program, which we'll can speak about in a different setting. I, I think there's kind of a systemic issue here for funding. We're talking about how do we fund the staff at the water board to preside over all these labs and accredit them. Now, how are we paying for the the DMV per se? But if the DMV, if, if the population is dropping because it's too costly or too much of a burden for them to retain their license, there's kind of more systemic funding issues. And we would like a more comprehensive solution, you know, to look at this. Because at the end of the day, I don't know if it's tenable for the lab population to keep dwindling. And if there is some kind of, you know, it'll stop, it'll get to a certain point where it'll stop. We don't know how low that is. But in the meantime, you are having a decrease of the ability to offer services. And I think that's important. And historically, California had a very robust network. Caitlin mentioned our 2015 numbers. I think we're in the 750 range around that junction. I mean, that is a fantastic lab network. And if we're down to 475, you've seen it cut in half, you know, arguably. And I don't know if that's ultimately good for all the, the great services that labs um, perform. And I know Allison's on the commercial side and we're working on a serial study. And when we talk to our commercial partners, you can really feel the same stretch they have um, with cost and with budgets and, and retaining individuals. And so there's a, a broader conversation about how do we support the lab community? Um, and so as we're kind of going into this one sliver of it with fees for the staff, I, I'd like if we could talk more holistically about all of it to um, essentially ensure we have the laboratory data and, and quality and services to provide to California. Okay, I can take that. There was a lot there, Jared. So let me know if I missed anything. Um, just starting with the numbers, um, you said 475, we're sitting around 575 right now. So about hundred more than um, the number that you, you said. Um, very astute observations about, you know, where is this decrease happening? That's something that we've been looking at with the board's economist. There has not been like an extreme impact to any one sector of the industry. So we're not seeing any kind of red flags that would um, cause us to have concern about any sort of destabilization in the industry. Um, but we are keeping a really close eye on it because we also, you know, want to make sure that the laboratories that we have in our population um, are uh, are the type of labs that we need in order to support the regulatory work in California. Um, in terms of the population dropping and the total number of laboratories, I do just want to remind you that you know, at CDPH, the fees were artificially low, right? They were not decreased and they were not increased for 10 years. So that's essentially getting a discount every single year on the cost to enter the market in California. Um, and on top of that, the regulatory oversight was minimal. Um, so you had a big boom in labs coming into the industry in California. And we really didn't have much check on the quality of those laboratories. Um, and so 
just the normal market forces that come in when you, you know, when you start regulating and fees get increase to where they, you know, where they actually rightfully should be to support a program, we've started to see labs dropping really since we came over in 2015, pretty steadily. Um, and, you know, it is important to us that the quality of the labs that we have in California, it, you know, have, there's a certain benchmark there, right? The number isn't necessarily the important thing if those laboratories are not meeting the minimum quality that our state regulatory agency partners need them to meet in the data that they are producing. So just for a general idea, some of the, the you know, we are the largest program um, in the nation, but the two most, the two state programs that are most comparable to us are New York and Texas. And those states have somewhere in the 300s for their labs. Um, and we don't expect to go down that far because our regulatory environment is quite different here in California. But just for an idea of comparison, we're still sitting much higher than the, the nearest states to us, um, which would be New York and then Texas behind that. So I don't know if that helps you kind of get a perspective on what California, it, where we're at versus the rest of the nation. Um, but we certainly are um, looking at this and doing the analysis with the board's economist. This will be um, part of our presentation, which is happening on May 2nd. Um, is when we're going to the board with that informational item and um, we will be able to talk about it there and you'll be able to speak to the board about it then. Did I miss anything? No, that was good, thank you. Um, I'll correspond with you offline about that number. I apologize for mistaking it. I have an email that says to the otherwise so we can work through that and I'd appreciate it getting corrected the right way. Yeah. Um, and thanks for the timeshare on the May 2nd. Um, that's good to know too. Hey, good morning, Debbie. Um, you have your hand up. Sure, thanks. I actually also have a question for um, Caitlin. I was wondering um, in looking at this and then looking at the cost, of, first of all, I, I also wanna just echo Jared's comments, but um, in looking at the cost, are you seeing any um, and what you anticipated, uh, especially as we looked at the way that, that fees were set out, uh, whether it be for um, just, you know, uh, just to get recertified or if it was for uh, site assessments for, you know, out of state, are, have, you, have you kind of kept time and looked at and continue to look at the time required for that in, um, in, in some ways that could help inform where, where fees need to go? Um, are you meaning like in terms of time accounting, like staff time being used, or I'm not sure I un understand your question, Debbie, I'm well, sorry. It's okay. It's, it's not, um, I'm not being like so specific, like, okay, we met and it took me 1.5 hours to do this, but uh, you know, more towards a, okay, we really, uh, staff, we really spend our time, you know, this is something that takes quite a bit of time. This is, it, it, even, I'm not saying that like the 1.5 or the 1.25, but it is a, hey, this person will take a day to do this. So they'll take a half a day that we start knowing what the patterns are of the type of work that's being done. And, and I know that, you know, you'd also said that part of the justification was you guys were spending a lot of time with the different state agencies trying to work to meet their needs. And I know that was the a, a, a big motivation for, for some of the changes there. But really, I think when the fee structure was set up, we were kind of guessing. I mean, it seemed like that was kind of guessing as to what was going to be needed. And I'm wondering if you're, you're, you're at least tracking that to some way that you're narrowing in a little bit better as to, to really what you're spending time on? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. And thanks for bringing that up because we did talk about this before. Um, so yes, we do staff work time analysis. Um, that is part of the reason that we move towards charging for assessments because those are really time intensive and we want to recoup that. Um, we um, are looking and we, we have, so the funding, the alternative funding source that we got is basically from drinking water. And that took drinking water, the division of drinking water, recognizing that, you know, we are putting staff time into working for the, working on behalf of the division. Um, 
And we are hoping, you know, potentially to get that type of recognition from other divisions that we do work for, other agencies or programs. That's the type of comment that would be probably useful to bring to the board meeting in May, um, just so that our board members can hear that, you know, potentially there's stakeholder support for that type of um, that type of option. Um, at this point, we just haven't, um, you know, had any success or haven't haven't really been able to advance that. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, are any other questions at this time? Um, I don't see any on the email. Um, and uh, I'll just, uh, Caitlin, Christine, do you have anything you want to um, add? I think you guys have provided some good information. And just to, I think, reiterate the informational item, am I correct by saying this is going to the board on May 2nd? That's right. Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, so, again, with that said, I just want to state that um, you know this is the uh, first part of the budget process. Gives us an opportunity to kind of walk through the numbers. Um, we'll have more information come our June meeting, and of course, prior to that meeting, we send out the agenda and all the documentation. Um, I also want to state that you know if you have any questions regarding, of course, the fees and and the information that was. Um, that was discussed today, please don't hesitate to reach out to Cassandra or myself um, and uh, we can work through that and we can also involve the program staff and we can, of course, meet on that. Um, our, our next meeting is uh, scheduled for June 13th, as I mentioned earlier. Um, we're hoping to have an in-house portion meeting also with, uh, along with the Zoom. So um, those are our next steps. And so I also just want to say, you know, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, appreciate you guys taking time out of your day to meet with us. Um, and so with that said, um, I'm not hearing anything else. So um, we'll be signing off now and um, uh, look forward to meeting you guys in June. Um, everyone have a great day and a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you.